The following program has been made possible by an educational grant from Bayer Healthcare Pharmaceuticals, Inc. I would like to welcome you to an encore program in the MS from A to Z series that we've filmed at the University of Washington. We are pleased to be able to announce this encore presentation of a very distinguished visitor from Australia, Dr. Kenneth Pakenham. Dr. Edie, who I will introduce in a minute, will introduce Dr. Pakenham, tell you about his experience in his research, and he will then enlighten us with some of the approaches he has, kind of rather remarkably, and I think quite good approaches he has to the problem of patients' disease with MS. Dr. Dawn Eady is familiar to you who've seen this series because she gave a program on pain and fatigue in MS. She's currently a professor of rehabilitation medicine at the University of Washington. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Don Eady. Thank you, Don. Well, thank you everyone for coming today. It's with great pleasure that I'm uh, here today to introduce you to our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Kenneth Pakenham. Uh, Dr. Pakenham comes all the way from Australia. He's actually an associate professor in clinical and health psychology at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, he has been actually doing work in the area of clinical and health psychology, both research and clinical work, for more than 25 years. And for the past seven years, has been director of the Behavior Research and Therapy Center within the School of Psychology at the University of Queensland. Uh, he has more than 90 publications, both um, uh, well-regarded articles in scientific journals as well as chapters. Um, on a range of topics, many of them MS and coping with illness. He does both intervention research, he does uh, theoretically bu theory building research, and also longitudinal research within MS and other disease groups such as cancer. Um, and, and I think one of the real uh, reasons that we're real excited about his presentation today is that he comes to us and approaches his work from both the views of a scientist as well as a practitioner, and he's really the quintessential scientist practitioner that, that we treasure in terms of informing intervention and, and care of people with MS. Um, so with that, I'd like to, I, rather than telling you a lot about his work, I'd like to introduce him and have him come up and give his talk. Thank you for those introductions and it's a pleasure to be here and I'm grateful for the inv invitation to be able to contribute. I'd like to thank you all for the hospitality that you've uh, shown me and um, it's been great to see your beautiful city, bits of your beautiful city, Seattle. So it's lovely to be here. Um, with multiple sclerosis, much of the early research is focused on the difficulties that people experience and the psychopathology that can sometimes come from the experience of multiple sclerosis. Um, over the last 15 years, I've had an interest in attempting to try and understand the process of how people adjust and adapt uh, to some of the difficulties around the experience of multiple sclerosis. And I think that um, if we only try, if we only look at, look for pathology, then that's what we'll find. But if we look beyond pathology, we may find strengths and virtues that are characteristics of every human being whether they have multiple sclerosis or not. So this story today is really about the strengths and virtues of uh, people experiencing some uh, extreme life difficulties through their illness. So it's about resilience. And there's good reasons to look at resilience. Uh, there are a lot of well-established theories that have been developed over many, many decades from various disciplines and from various vantage points that tell us that um, uh, people have a great capacity to grow and to extend themselves. 
even in the face of uh, great adversity. Rogers' client-centered therapy uh, focuses on this. Maslow's self-actualization work focuses on this. The existential theories, in particular Frankel's wonderful story of having been in Auschwitz and having been stripped of everything physically, but still finding meaning and a place to grow, even in that physical devastation. Um, the more recent positive psychology movement points to these capacities of the human being. Um, the many years of work on post-traumatic growth, and now we have the third wave cognitive and behaviour therapies that focus much more on the capacities of human beings to um, deal with difficulties. There's also a huge amount of empirical support for the capacity of the human being to uh, be resilient in the face of adversity. Susan Folkman's work on uh, people suffering from AIDS and their bereaved carers. Bonanno's work on uh, people with uh, trauma and various types of losses. There's all the post-traumatic and benefit-finding work that points to this capacity as well. And of course, we hear anecdotal stories through the news on TV, from our friends and in our networks of how people have uh, remarkable capacity to deal with very difficult situations. I'd like to illustrate uh, this by telling a story of a person I know. His name is Jack. So if you would bear for me with me for one minute, I would like to be Jack. And um, I hope I can do justice to his story and tell you a little bit um, about his story that will illustrate some of the points I'd like to make, make later. My name is Jack and um, I'm 42 years of age and I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis seven years ago. And I'm now in a motorised wheelchair. I, I can't sleep at night because I have muscle cramps and I get really anxious that when I go to bed I'm going to get cramps and I'm not going to be able to move. And sometimes that happens. So sometimes I don't go to sleep. I stay up all night, I send emails or I, I read or I work on the computer in some way. I have pain down my spine every time I move my head forward, or almost every time. I have electrical currents going down my spine. Can you imagine what that would be like to have voltage going down the core of your being, down your spine, down your central nervous system? Sometimes I can't feel the ends of my fingers. I live in Brisbane, it's very hot. And all of this gets worse during the summer when it's very hot and humid. Worst of all, I lost, I lost my employment, so I no longer work. I'm an engineer, I was an engineer. And you know, being an engineer wasn't a career for me. It wasn't a job, it was my vocation was everything to me. And I've lost that. And that was devastating. My arm, my right arm now has gone. My hand and my arm I can't use. I can only use my left hand for typing. And I have carers who come in and invade my unit get me up in the morning, wash me, take me to the shower. I've lost my privacy, I've lost my independence. I have to rely on my elderly parents. I never got on well with my father and I have to rely on him to help me about. My mother is deaf and is so frustrating when I speak to her and ask her to direct my wheelchair in certain directions because she can't hear. And you know, I don't like to say this, but in the quiet time, I get really 
down and I cry. And that's a hard thing for me as a man to say that. And I want to tell you something else as well that, you know, I, I grapple with wanting to live. And that's really hard for me. I, I know I've seen the wards where people with MS live who are worse off than me. And I don't think I can do that. I don't think I can go there. And you know what, I, I, I don't know, I want to, I, I don't know when the cutoff is for me to be able to make a decision to take my own life before I get to a point where I can't make that decision and I end up in one of those wards. And that is absolutely devastating for me. I sometimes can't bear to look at it, but in a quiet time when I'm not distracted, it comes floating into my mind. I had to get help. And in getting some help, I started to look at perhaps what I could do. And as an engineer and having lost my vacation, I wondered whether there was some possibility of investing some of my skills and my knowledge, even though I can't move. And I, I found some opportunities. And now I work as an access consultant. Most of it's voluntary, I can't get paid. I spent many years trying to get salary continuance insurance. And you know, it's an interesting thing. You, you tell me, you professionals tell me about loss and grief. You professionals tell me about, about trying to do more. But you know, I don't even have time to go through what you call loss and grief, because I lose something. And I'm just grappling with that, and then I lose something else. And I'm trying to grapple with that, and then I lose something else again. I never have time to go through what you call loss and grief. But you know what? I have, I have found a synergy between what's important to me, which has been my vocation in life, and my disability. Now I have those two things, and they come together, and now I'm an access consultant. I advocate in government, I advocate in the local MS society. Sometimes they ask me to contribute when there's constructions or buildings going on, and how best to make access possibilities for people with disabilities. So now I have that, but don't get me wrong, I still have quiet moments where I still have that image about how long do I want to go on like this for. Thank you for listening to my story. So that's Jack's story. And Jack shows two things. Jack shows the capacity in the spite of immense hardship to call up something from within that is his life, that is his purpose, that is his meaning of existence. And even in the face of limited movement, of pain and all those symptoms, bring that together and still move out, make a phone call, type an email, go and visit a government officer, get involved in something, get engaged in something. So resilience isn't about the absence of discomfort. It is about managing the adversity and continuing your life. And I think Jack's story uh, illustrates that very well and hopefully illustrates some of the other points that I'd like to make one of the issues that I think is really important about MS that 
uh, differentiates it from many other illnesses is that it is very complex. And I'd like to just very quickly, because I'm sure many of you know all about MS, but I'd just like to highlight what I think provide this complex mix that the human being is faced with when, when they're faced with MS. Because we use the term MS and it's quick and it's easy and it's a label. But this is what it means. It means a disease course that's variable and unpredictable. Now we can say that easily, but when you're faced with uncertainty, and as humans we don't like uncertainty, that in itself is an immense challenge. The etiology is unknown. We don't know where it comes from. So pe many people with MS come up with their own causal sense-making of uh, how it came about in their life. There's a huge range of symptoms. Some of the most common, fatigue, cognitive impairment, pain, but the sexual dysfunction, loss of bowel and bladder and mobility and visual and speech impairments, emotional changes. And any person can have any mix of those and many others. So with that range of symptoms, disability can affect many, if not all, as in the case of Jack's life. Um, and the onset is often in young adulthood. And it's a developmental phase when we're not prepared for physical limitation and disability. There's an age range in this room. So for some of you who are older, that sort of notion of the body starting to um, get a bit crackly and not function so well is just sort of part of what we might expect as we age. But you younger ones, I'm sure, aren't looking forward to loss of mobility, loss of functioning. Um, there is no cure and there's often only minimal symptomatic relief. Some of the drugs that are used to treat some of the symptoms of MS have themselves impacts on mental health functioning. The rehabilitation programs are complex. Jack was seen a physiotherapist. Jack was seen a hand therapist. Jack was seen an occupational therapist. Jack had a a coach in a gym to help with physical movement, a neurologist, the GP, and so on. So understandably, there are some adverse mental health outcomes. The two most prominent are depression and anxiety. The annual prevalence rate is around about 20%. The lifetime prevalence rate around about 50%, much higher than in the general community. Don't know that much about anxiety, but it seems to be a lifetime prevalence rate for around about 36%. The other significant mental health issue is suicide. And suicide uh, is related to both depression and anxiety. And as uh, Jack demonstrated, uh, the processing of the possibility of ending his life. But then there's the other side. So here we have a coin. And on one side are the painful negative outcomes of difficulties, which are natural and to be expected. But then on the other side, attached to those, out, to those negative outcomes, are some of the positive, growthful capacities. So there's now a growing number of studies that document that people with MS report a large number of gains or benefits associated with their experience of MS. Jack actually says that he now sees his disability as an advantage. But you know, that intermixes with him at times still wanting to perhaps end his life. So you can't take one without the other. They come together. There's also growing research that's starting to look not just at negative mental health outcomes, but some of the potential positive outcomes, like positive affect, life satisfaction, positive states in mind, and many others. There's an increasing attention on the resilience uh, factors that enhance well-being in people with MS. And some of my research shows that the positive and negative outcomes have unique antecedents. So there's perhaps different pathways to the negative outcomes and the positive outcomes. And then there are also some common antecedents to both. 
the whole range of stresses. Some of these are self-evident and many of them have been well researched, so I won't labour on them. But there's obviously the physical health stressors around the illness symptoms. Then there's all the treatment issues that the person has to grapple with. Then there's the career and employment, as Jack show. Then there's the financial issues, the education issues or the learning issues. And then there's the social and interpersonal difficulties. And then there's the psychological difficulties of fear of losing control, uncertainty, losses and many, many others. But I think the one that's least uh, attended to is the ex existential area of multiple sclerosis. And I think it's because people sort of have the sense, well, it's a sort of a chronic illness and really people aren't facing anything terminal or their, their life is not going to end with a diagnosis of MS. But nevertheless, uh, the literature is starting to show that people do grapple with existential issues. And from an interventionist point of view, I believe that the existential issues are central to getting people moving and active and getting the most out of their capacity that they have left. Because the existential issues are about the meaning of life. The existential issues is what is the purpose of my life? And there's no reason why Jack, in a motorised wheelchair, no movement in his arm, no capacity in his leg, there is no reason why he can't answer, ask the question and search for the answer. What is the purpose of my existence? And how can I invest my existence, my life, in the most uh, uh, optimal way I can? So I think um, that's one of the stressor areas that requires more um, attention. I'd like to now turn to the stress relapse link. Because this, I turn to this because there is some evidence that there's a relationship between the experience of stress and some of the medical uh, disease outcomes, in particular relapse, within MS. And then there are the individual skills and capacities that can impact on that link. And I think that that is worthy of attention. So there was a meta-analysis by Ma in 2004 and he concluded a moderately large effect sizes. He also concluded that that was clinically meaningful and several later reviews agreed with that and said yes, it is clinically meaningful. And then in 2010, a more recent review has confirmed those findings. So we're getting quite a good pattern, a consistent pattern that there is an association. Now it is only an association, there is no claim that there's a causal direction either way, but there is an association. So if we impact in some aspect on that association, we may change the link between the two. There are all sorts of factors that potentially influence the uh, stress relapse uh, link. And um, I'm not going to go into the, the, the susceptibility to viral infections. There are various characteristics of the stress, of the type, the severity, whether it's chronic or acute. What I'm more interested in are the things that can be changed. And that is the stress and coping processes that I'm going to talk in more detail to soon that um, seem to influence that link. Brown and others did a review of the factors that do influence, seem to influence that link. And most of those were coping strategies, coping resources, and cognitive appraisals. So here's the model, and I'm just going to very quickly go through this. Ignore the bottom uh, bolded section of each of the boxes. So here we have a stressor. And on the other side, we have the person's adjustment to the stressor. So this is sort of classic stress and coping uh, framework applied to MS. It's not a tight theoretical diagram, although it reflects the uh, essentials of the theory, but it's more of a working conceptual map, I think, for practitioners and also for researchers. So um, 
Over here, we have the uh, illness and treatment factors that can act as moderators of the effects of a stressor. And then we have the biographics, the inbuilt things of the person, their age and their gender. They also can act as moderators of the effects of the stressor. But the three that I'm most interested in here, which can be altered through intervention, are the appraisal processes, the coping strategies, and the coping resources. So the theory says that these three processes mediate, they in fact determine the effects of the stressor, regardless of the severity of the stressor. So appraisal is a cognitive process. So we perceive a stressor and we think about it. And presumably we think about it in terms of the extent to which it's threatening, to which it's harmful or challenging, opportunity for growth, how controllable it is. And then there are other cognitive processes that I won't go into detail over all of them. But essentially, the person thinks about and perceives and registers in their brain the occurrence of a stressful event. And to some extent, those percep perceptions determine whether the person regards this as something that needs to be dealt with or can be just left. Okay, so we can get a group of people in the room, they can all have be exposed to the same stressor, but we will have lots of variations in the extent to which each person perceives that same event as stressful. And that's to do with what's going on in our head to some extent. And then there are our coping strategies. So these are the effortful behaviours we engage in to respond to the event. There are those that are emotion focused. They attempt to relieve the distress associated with the stressor. There are the problem solving type strategies. There are meaning focus strategies, ones that try to infuse meaning or change the meaning of the event. And then there are the coping resources. They might be internal. They're the dispositional things, you know, the things that we're sort of um, uh, almost inherited as part of our temperament, you know, an orientation to be optimistic or an orientation to be pessimistic or an orientation to see control as coming from the outside, etc. Then there are the external resources, um, most commonly researched as social support. And then there are the adjustment outcomes, both in terms of the positive domain and the negative domain. So that's the model that I would now like to turn to with respect to some of the evidence. So if we take the model as a whole, there's reasonable evidence to suggest that that model explains a fair amount of the variability in adjustment outcomes in people with MS. The evidence comes in cross-sectional studies and in some longitudinal studies. Other evidence, the stress and coping variables and meaning-making variables are stronger predictors of anxiety than the illness factors. Cross-sectional and longitudinal studies show that coping processes account for more variance in measures of depressive symptoms than illness variables. And the same frameworks have been successfully applied to people caring for people with MS. And finally, a review of correlates of adjustment to MS, um, published in 2009, showed that most of these coping, there was good evidence for most of these coping processes to be correlates of adjustment to MS. So that's taking the model more broadly, but if we go down to each of those coping processes, regarding appraisal, higher appraised stress is related to poorer adjustment regardless of disease severity. Appraisal of a stressor is a stronger predictor of relapse than the objective measure of the stressor. And then there are some other cognitive processes that have also been shown to be related to outcomes in MS, illness uncertainty and self-efficacy. In terms of coping strategies, I mentioned that um, the categories are by and large the problem focused, emotion focused, and there are two types of emotion focused. When we um, experience emotional distress, we can um, avoid it or get rid of it 
in some way. We can suppress it, avoid it, push it down, squish it down, squash it, put it aside, typically called avoidance. Then there are the approach emotion-focused strategies. They're the ones that actually sort of sit with or be with the emotional distress rather than get rid of it. Then there are the meaning-focused strategies, and these are the strategies where the person tries to reframe, change the meaning, alter the significance of the event for themselves. And then particularly for carers who are coping with someone with MS, uh, rela uh, relationship-focused coping strategies are particularly important. And sometimes they're not so helpful. It's about nagging the person, or it's about pushing the person to do stuff, or it's about supportive engagement. The evidence, cross-sectional and longitudinal studies show that adjustment is related to a reliance on avoidance coping strategies. So, this is a consistent story with some of the other chronic illness areas. By and large, generally speaking, relying on avoidance to deal with the issues around a chronic health problem in the long run does not seem to be helpful. But I'd like to give a caution here, and that is there is no absolute bad or good coping strategy. I've done some research to show that avoidance is actually um, effective when dealing with an acute health issue. Women recalled for an abnormal mammogram did better subsequently if they relied on avoidance than the women who engaged in problem solving, talking to people, sorting things out type activity. So here's an acute th threat. Sometimes it is effective to just put everything aside and let it go and then see what the outcome is. So um, a warning is uh, one strategy is never always bad or always good. Stress and coping says you determine whether a coping strategy is effective by its fruit, by its outcomes. And that's consistent with a lot of other theoretical frameworks. And the key question is, for the person, is, is this working for you? Is it working for you in the long term? And if the answer is yes, let it go. If the answer is no, then let's, let's look at something else. Weaker evidence for better adjustment being related to positive reappraisal, that's sort of giving a positive twist to the issue that they're dealing with, acceptance coping, and social support seeking. So those findings aren't quite as strong as the, the link between avoidance and poor outcomes, but there's emerging trends there. The, importantly, coping strategies have been shown to moderate the effects of stress on disease outcomes. Moa's work. Um, has shown that. And it's been shown to have some direct effects on relapses. In terms of the coping resources, the two most um, researched is the internal dispositional resource of optimism and the external resource social support. And as we might expect, optimism and social support are related to better adjustment and Denison's review um, uh, suggests this. However, there are again some cautions. Um, in relation to social support, there can be some harmful effects. Support that's perceived as unsupportive, support that's perceived as overprotective, or support that is uh, uh, flavoured with some conflict is actually um, not effective for the person with MS. And there is also some emerging research, not in MS, but in some of the other illness areas, that optimism um, it, to extreme points is actually not, uh, is actually harmful. Extreme points meaning where optimism is, is sort of um, uh, not in touch with reality and it's, it's very unrealistic. Then there is meaning making. We're not sure where meaning making goes in the model, and I won't get into a conceptual issue about where that goes, um, but I'm just going to raise the issue that meaning making, how a person uh, makes meaning of an adverse event, 
is an important process. And there are a lot of theoretical frameworks that suggest that. Park here in um, 2010 has done an excellent review in psychology bulletin of the meaning-making literature. Um, Yanov is probably one of the, um, Yanov Bullman is probably one of the major theoreticians around meaning-making. So here's a quick, quick uh, run through. Adverse events can disrupt some of the assumptions that we have about life, about ourselves, about security, about certainty, about others, and about how the life works. So, you know, here you are, you're going, on a lo going uh, along in your life, and then bang, something happens. You get a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Or you've had your diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, and you're going along okay, and then bang, there's a major health deterioration. And this is serious. This is really suggesting that stuff ain't going very well. So then you start to question things. You start to question all these beliefs that are sort of hidden in the background of our minds that guide us through life. Now, it, it suggested that when all of that uh, assumption about life gets turfed up and tossed around, we start to feel a bit jittery. We start to feel a bit distressed. It produces a sense of meaningless. What is the purpose of my life? What is the security in relationships? I thought good things happened to good people, etc. Then that creates some existential distress. What is the purpose of my life, etc. The theories go such that then people attempt to rebuild meaning after it's been shattered and scattered. That take, hopefully that the rebuilding of the meaning takes into account the new reality. Two possible sense-making processes. Sense-making, finding a reason or explanation for the event that's occurred or benefit finding, something positive or significant about the event that can allow you to incorporate it and absorb it into your life. So sense-making. I've looked at uh, sense-making and people with MS, and these are the dimensions that come up. People make sense of their MS by redefining their life purpose. So they shift it, they alter it a bit, like Jack did. Okay, so he wasn't going to be the engineer and uh, doing all of this. He now becomes an engineer consultant. And now he becomes involved in advocacy. There's some shift in remoulding of purpose and direction in his life. Acceptance. Acceptance is about embracing the realities. It's not about a resignation. It's not about putting up with. Spiritual perspective, obviously some people will make sense of an adverse event through religious or spiritual perceptions, explanations or belief systems. Um, luck, things just happen, that's how life is. Um, some people explore their values and reprioritize. Um, and then of course, people will try and find a causal explanation. You know, I was too stressed at work, or it was the um, uh, pesticides that I've been eating, or it's the immune system. A whole range of um, attributions that people will come up with to try and explain the cause. A third of people in the sample could not make sense of their MS. And those people who couldn't make sense didn't do very well in terms of adjustment outcomes. However, if they anticipated some hope that they could sort of make sense, um, they had better life satisfaction. Sense-making predicted adjustment concurrently in over 12 months. Sense-making um, dimensions that characterised uh, perceptions of self-worth and a balance between the randomness and uncertainty of life um, but also having some control were better, uh, were, were related to better adjustment. Benefit finding, the uh, dimensions to finding benefits in MS. Some people saw growing compassion and empathy as a result of having MS. Some grew spiritually. Some became more mindfully oriented. Um, some talked about the growth in their family relationships, lifestyle changes personal growth and various qualities and finding new opportunities. 
and benefit finding is also related to adjustment over time. It seems that people with MS and their carers engage in a sharing meaning making process. Um, many benefit finding and sense making themes reported by people with MS are qualitatively similar to those reported by their carers. The sense making and benefit finding of the person with MS is correlated with the respective sense making and benefit finding of their carer. And the sense making and benefit finding of one partner is associated with better adjustment of the other partner. So another thing that I'd like to really emphasise here is that understanding the person with MS and how they cope with it is also understanding how they and their MS relates interpersonally to the people that are close to them. Because it's a fluid, bi-directional relationship. It's not an isolation. There are research limitations, and just very briefly, there's a wide range of uh, measures that have been used to uh, assess coping processes, which is problematic. There's a reliance on generic, generic scales that lack sensitivity to the MS context, and there's largely cross-sectional designs. And some of the relationships don't hold up when we um, pit them to longitudinal designs. The other complicated issue is that that model that I showed uh, earlier is dynamic. It's constantly, constantly flowing. There's all sorts of feedback loops. It's essentially transactional. So it's hard with our uh, statistical methodological approaches to capture that. Um, and then one of the other issues is that, as I said in the beginning, MS is complex. And so it really depends on the specific issue that the person is dealing with as to the resources and coping strategies that are going to be effective for that. Okay, I'm going to go to carers. Why are carers important in rehabilitation? Why should we even consider them? Well, they provide much of the care for people with MS. They have a huge impact on their um, medical care and their psychosocial care, etc. The caregiving that carers give is of great economic value to the community and society. They are a vital source of information about the functioning of the person with MS. They can be an ally and resource in implementing rehabilitation plans. And the disease affects both the carer and the person with MS. And there's research showing that the two respond to the disease as a couple, as a synchronised unit. I've looked at what caregivers do. They do a lot. And a scale that I developed showed that their caregiving duties can fall into four areas. That there are instrumental type caregiving demands, the daily activity caregiving demands, the psychological and emotional care, and the social practical care. Now the last two are the two that are most often ignored or overlooked or are hidden. What we're most um, aware of are the physical care uh, behaviours that, that carers engage in. But interestingly, um, when we look at whether caregiving in these different domains differentially relates to adjustment outcomes over time, we find that higher psycho-emotional and social practical care is related to higher benefit finding. So the more the carer is involved in the emotional, social, practical care of the person with MS, the more gain or benefit they get from their caregiving role. But on the other side, um, this higher ADL care is related to lower life satisfaction and positive states of mind, and higher psychosocial uh, emotional care is related to more distress. So there's the doubled edge sword or the coin that I was talking about before. On the one side, uh, and this is just a fact of life, isn't it? On the one side, there is adversity and hardship, but right next to that and attached to that are the positive possibilities, potentials and capacities. And so with caregiving, there are the rewards and the costs. They stick together and they ebb and flow. Um, as you might expect, as disability increases, the hours of caregiving increase, the nature of the caregiving becomes more intimate and more demanding.
There are the negative outcomes for carers. Um, they experience adverse impacts in a whole lot of areas, quality of life, health, social life, finances. And these negative uh, aspects are often collectively referred to as carer burden. It's a term that's often used but not well defined. And carer burden in people, caring for people with MS is related to poorer outcomes. Interestingly, the negative impacts can emerge soon after diagnosis, before physical disability even emerges in the person with MS. So this underscores this other process that occurs in caregiving. And it is about the hidden emotional, psychosocial uh, links between the person with MS and their carer. The emotional impact of uh, MS caregiving is being described as chronic sorrow. Compared to the general um, population, MS carers report higher psychological distress, lower satisfaction. Approximately 24 to 28 percent of MS carers report clinically significant global distress. There's also problems with depression and anxiety. But there's positive outcomes as well. Um, MS carers report greater love for their spouses than a normative sample. 11% of spouses reported that their marital relationship had improved since the diagnosis of MS. However, there is also um, a lot of break, relationship breakups and divorce that can occur as well. And then there are the caring, caregiving benefits that uh, carers have reported. Greater insight into illness and hardship. There are the caregiving gains, the personal growth, the strengthening of relationships, an increased appreciation of life, the health gains, and a change in priorities and personal goals, etc. So, coping with caregiving, um, same model, and if you look at the bottom part of each of those boxes, we see added some extra uh, variables or constructs that are specific to carers. I won't go through all of those here on the model, but just speak to these by way of summarising some of the research. We know that there's a variety of illness characteristics that are related to lower carer wellbeing, and they are psychiatric symptoms, particularly depression, cognitive impairment, greater functional disability, and more severe disease progression. There are also characteristics of the carer that are related to poorer wellbeing, being female, being the spouse, longer caregiving duration, and a higher level of caregiving tasks. Coping. So if we apply the same model, um, lower stress appraisals are related to better well-being. Higher social support is related to better well-being. Less reliance on avoidance coping and relationship-focused coping that's critically oriented. Meaning-making is also related to better outcomes. MS and the family. MS uh, disrupts family functioning and parenting tasks. Parenting is a particular issue in MS because many people are diagnosed at an age when they either have family or are thinking about having family. And we know that parents with MS are concerned about the effects of their illness on their children. And um, we also know that the children of parents with MS have particular issues to deal with. A recent review suggests that parental MS has a negative impact. They differ from uh, children of healthy parents in a number of areas. They also take on more caregiving responsibilities than children who have healthy parents. I've just undertaken a study, 88 families, I won't go through all the details of this, um, 88 families where two or, two or more of the family uh, participated in a longitudinal study. 85 parents, 55 partners and 130 children. We looked at what the kids do in terms of caregiving. They engage in instrumental, social, emotional, personal, intimate and domestic household care. Not too dissimilar to what the adult carers do. And greater caregiving. Uh, in the children is related to more disability in the parent, as you would expect. 
But there are, again, the positive and the negative outcomes. Personal intimate care, interestingly, is related to better adjustment, whereas caregiving in the other domains is related to poor adjustment. How might we explain that? Attachment theory would suggest that um, providing personal care strengthens the bonds between parent and child. Parentification theory, which is about kids taking on adult parenting type roles, um, suggests that um, that's not adaptive and not helpful. And perhaps some of the poor outcomes related to some of these caregiving activities are because of the parentification issue. Here's a model to try and understand how children adjust to a parent coping with MS. I might say that this study drew the greatest interest from the MS community than any other study I've conducted over 15 years. I got people phoning me, emailing me, writing letters, um, wanting to be involved, wanting to contribute and saying how important this issue is because the whole issue of having children, having family, being a parent in the context of MS has been greatly neglected. Here's a model. It's Pedersen and Revitson. We have three groups of variables. We have the parental illness variables. Now I included depression because we know that parental depression has a considerable impact on child outcomes, and depression is common in, in MS. But of course I also included a uh, variable that tapped uh, illness levels, activities of daily living. And at the end here we have the family outcomes at a different time point and the youth outcomes. In terms of family, we've got the parents reporting on level of family cohesion, level of family conflict. And then we've got the children reporting on their difficulties, somatisation, which is vague physical complaints, and then their positive outcomes down here. And then in the middle, the model suggests that the effects of illness on these family and youth outcomes are mediated by role redistribution, which is really the caregiving, the stress associated with that, and then the stigma associated with being close to someone with a disability. So the dotted lines show the direct effects. Depression is directly related to um, both family and youth outcomes, whereas ADL is by and large mediated by the, um, the mediators. I won't go into that. I'm a bit attached to that, but um, because it, it sort of conceptually uh, helps us to understand the process of children adjusting to parental MS. And I think that this is important for parents, I think it's important for the whole family. CBT is the major intervention for um, psychological intervention that's got some evidence base in MS. and there are a wide range of cognitive and behaviour therapy techniques that have been used. Um, there are a lot of other types of uh, interventions that have been used. And there are very few adult carer interventions. There's, there's only one published by uh, Marcia Finlayson. There is one young carer. Uh, intervention that I published. It's a pilot study, so that's an intervention for children of a parent with MS. So there are large gaps here. And I think the intervention directions are this. I think we need a holistic approach that uh, accounts for the wide range of factors that shape adaptation to MS and the multifaceted complex nature of the illness. I think there needs to be a greater emphasis on existential issues. And I think that this is in keeping with recent trends, at least within psychology. Um, positive psychology suggests that we need to encourage uh, people to go beyond pathology and look for strengths and virtues. The third wave cognitive and behaviour therapies are much more integrative in their approaches and they push for a more holistic approach. There's no published studies on one of the major third wave cognitive and behaviour therapies, 
acceptance and commitment therapy, abbreviated to ACT. The key elements of ACT are mindfulness and acceptance. And there is good evidence why we should start to apply acceptance and commitment therapy, therapy to people with MS. We know that acceptance coping has beneficial effects. So does acceptance, sense making, and there are some studies showing that mindfulness is effective in interventions with MS. And in a recent study, I develop an ACT operationalized measure of acceptance and showed that acceptance could account for changes in adjustment over 12 months. And ACT has been effectively applied to a wide range of chronic illnesses. And I'm not going to go into this, but this is a study where we looked at couples of uh, people coping with MS. And what we found is that the model explained 43% of the variance in depression in people with MS. And we found that uh, acceptance was related to better outcomes Mindfulness was related to better outcomes, not only in the individual, but they also crossed over and predicted better outcomes um, in the other person. More evidence for why we should use um, some of the third wave CBT. Uh, colleagues and I have developed a resilience training package, that's what it's called. It is really fueled primarily by acceptance and commitment therapy strategies that target the five key resilience protective factors that Southwick identified in their review. And there's the resilience shield. We call it a shield. And so here we have the five resilience factors, positive emotions, coping strategies, social support, meaning, cognitive flexibility. And here we have the domains of human functioning, thinking, feeling, acting or doing, relations and being. And then the intervention targets each of those areas. The pilot showed um, significant change in a wide range of variables there, even in uh, total cholesterol. We've uh, mounted an RCT, the methodology for that is uh, referenced there, and we're just going through the data now. And I'm sorry I rushed towards the end. Thank you.